Hello, everybody. Okay. Okay, it's one o'clock, so I'm going to kick this off. Um, so welcome to the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland. Anybody here for the first time? Yeah. Oh. Okay, brilliant. Um, today is National Sporting Heritage Day, and to mark it, we are launching our new guide to sports records, which is conveniently based at the back of the room. Um, you're all welcome to take a copy. Um, and please read it. Um, Prony has a rich treasure trove of sporting material, ranging from football to figure skating, from athletics to archery. And this guide is an important research tool for anybody interested in learning more about our local sporting heritage. Sport plays an important role in our communities. It brings people together. Um, it it um, enriches us. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there's nearly always a sport that somebody can identify with, and it's very much a part of the fabric of our society. So its origins and developments are fascinating, um, and the archives are there to be celebrated. This is the latest iteration of the guide, which I originally compiled back in the late 1990s, so I have a vested interest in it. Though much of the current guide is not my work, it's been extensively overhauled by our staff. I should pay thanks to our graphics team in the Department for Communities who really discoed it up um, and have knocked it out of the park with the art and design. The, we're delighted today to welcome a truly wonderful speaker um, who will launch the guide. Dr. Helena Byrne is a librarian who specializes in web archiving at the British Library and is an independent researcher who focuses on the history of women's football in Ireland. In her role as curator of web archives at the British Library, she has been the lead curator on a number of sports collections for the UK web archive. Now, this is not the first time Helena has spoken here, so um, we're delighted to welcome you back. Helena is going to discuss today her own associations with the Northern Ireland Women's Football Association, and at the end we'll have time for questions. Um, the, the talk is Game Changer, looking back, on the first UFO competition for women. And women's football is very popular at the moment, but its origins, it has been around a while. It's been around as a UFO sport back since it was recognized in the 70s. So, you know, it's been going nearly 50 years. And then after Helene has spoken, um, we have some sporting documents on display. So you'll be welcome to see a display of sporting documents in our reading room. And Brett, over here, stand up, Brett. <laughs> and, We'll escort you upstairs so you can see the documents. Um, I know I think we've got stuff on display related to women's football. Um, Pierre, Baron Pierre de Corbertin, the founder of the Modern Olympics Games, I think we've got a letter of his on display. So before I ask Helena to speak, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go through the housekeeping. So it's my pleasure now to um, welcome Helena to come and talk to us. Thank you. I'm just going to get my timer ready so I could talk all day about this, so I, will, <laughs> I don't want to keep you uh, past your time. So um, as Stephen was saying, I've got two hats when I come to women's football. So I've um, here both as from British Library, but also as an independent researcher. So I've got two contact email addresses there, depending which you want to contact me on. But you can get me for both on Twitter. So uh, this is just a bit short overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. So looking at the background to the first UEFA competition for women's football, some of the sources that I've used in this research, um, the Northern Ireland women national team starting in 1973, and then women's football in UEFA, the first UEFA competition in 1982, and why this history is important and sources for future historians. So uh, this research that I'm presenting today is based on a chapter that is coming in a forthcoming book about uh, women's football across Britain and Ireland. And it features a lot of different chapters um, looking at uh, um, the different nations and also a little bit further afield like France and Australia um, and other countries in Europe. Um, but it also, um, if you look at the image, I'm not sure if you're going to recognize that, but that is uh, the front of Butlins, the field in 1976 when uh, the Republic of Ireland faced Northern Ireland in an international friendly match. And that's um, Ireland defending, Republic of Ireland defending the goal now. And uh, that's going to be on the front cover, which is quite exciting because, um, uh, and there's going to be other chapters about Ireland, Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland in the book as well. But some of the sources, so that's why uh, 
That picture is quite exciting because it comes from a personal collection and through one player's, uh, former player's personal collections of those photographs and then another player from Northern Ireland who happens to have a team photo of Northern Ireland uh, at that match, we've been able to piece together the team sheets for both teams which weren't recorded in any of the newspapers at the time. A lot of researchers struggled to actually find what date the match was played and uh, on the back of one of the photos we were able to figure out from the stamp on the photograph from the shop what weekend it was and then through another uh, source then we find out the exact date. So uh, personal collections play a vital role in telling the stories of women's football along with some of the more official sources like the Prony Records. And for this particular chapter, I have to give a special thanks to Patricia Gregory, who was former member, uh, founding member of the Women's Football Association and also was on the UEFA Committee for Women's Football um, from the 1980s to 1994. And she um, shared a lot of her personal papers from the, her time in that role that helped me to write this um, chapter. But the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland have an amazing collection on Northern Irish women's football. It gives you really good insights into the history of club football in Northern Ireland, also the national team, but also internationally what's going on because you've correspondence from the Scottish Women's Football Association, correspondence from the WFA, from um, the, FA, the Ladies Football Association of Ireland and some other governing bodies further afield. So it kind of helps. It's not just important for Northern Irish history, but also for international um, football history. And... Um, Recently, only just this weekend, uh, we uh, I helped deposit um, some former papers from the Ladies Football Association in Dublin City Library and Archives. And that's the first official records that can be accessible, um, it will be accessible in the next couple of weeks, available in the Republic of Ireland to do it. Republic of Ireland Women's National Team. So before that, there wasn't any official archive you could go to to look at some of these, doc uh, to find out some of the history. It was all just through um, personal collections. And newspapers and also for the early period of women's football the women's football association archive held at the british library is really useful as well because before there was a governing body in northern ireland they were members they were affiliated to the women's football association so you get records of uh, reports at their agms about what's happening in northern ireland and this is a photo from the northern ireland's first official international match so women's football has got a very long history back from the uh, the first match in the late 1890s uh, but um, the first official international team from recognized by UEFA is 1973 and um, the, you have the Republic of Ireland uh, having a shot on the Northern Ireland goals and that's Hillary Brady in goals and I'm not I haven't been able to name the play Northern Ireland players yet so if anybody knows that's <laughs> it'd be great and uh, you can see Northern Ireland are wearing uh, black and white stripes and that was the away kit for Mayfair ladies football team that they borrowed uh, for the match because they didn't have a kit yet. And um, so it was black and white stripes with red shorts and red socks. And uh, you might have seen the BBC um, Gloria Hummingford um, clip that was circulating a, a while ago uh, where she interviewed the team before the match. And that's the only archival footage of um, the team. And uh, so we've... Uh, be able to get this picture of it but the next match they played they had a full green kit because they got some funding from the IFA to cover that but more research is needed into this history and especially the impact on the Troubles in forming because 1973 was one of the bloodiest years of the Troubles and uh, but women's football was still developing and uh, because pe uh, people loved football and brought communities together so there was a very strong relationship between the two governing bodies in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and through the Women's Football Association archive papers, we can see that they were reporting there that in terms of uh, football, Ireland is united because they, and you could see it also then how that relationship progressed through the records here in Prony because the correspondence between the two countries, they're supporting each other to develop the game because they don't really have any support from the men's governing body. They're uh, pushing each other to develop underage teams to organise more matches together to help improve their standards. So they're working very closely together to develop football. And women's football in UEFA. So I'm going to give a bit of background into the history of women's football and UEFA to, because that will help us then understand the barriers that a lot of players had to enter the first competition and the teams. So women's football has a long history, but 
the infrastructure to develop that is it's only in recent years that they're starting to get proper funding but the inequalities are so ingrained and systemic that it's still even now it's still challenging to um, develop further but it's improved a lot uh, so in the 1960s um, women's football became hugely popular across Europe and Ireland uh, women um, have always played but there were unofficial tournaments and unofficial matches and uh, indoor football was a we became immensely popular in the mid 1960s as well and that was a gateway for a lot of women to enter into uh, outdoor football as well because it was their first opportunity to play any kind of football game and you might have seen it's on the BBC iPlayer now the COPPA 71 documentary so this uh, goes through the history of that big tournament an unofficial World Cup that was held in Mexico and um, it was organized by a body called I say FIFA the, uh, <laughs> my French pronunciation is terrible, but the F-I-E-F-F. -F. And uh, that was mainly sponsored by corporate interests. So UEFA and FIFA were really unhappy that there was these corporate interests in women's football. And so to try and get more control over the, how football was being developed and used, that's when in 1971, they, um, mandated, UEFA mandated members to recognise women's football. And the only governing body that didn't accept in the vote was Scotland. And, uh, <laughs> but they had to do it anyway. <laughs> and uh, they started to recognise women's football and they formed their first committee for women's football. So uh, they organised this committee and it ran until 1978, but they didn't really do anything. Because of the pressure that they put on FIFA, it disbanded in 72. They didn't fail to organise a tournament. They couldn't really get teams to sign up for it. So the external threat had kind of gone away from UEFA. So they kind of sat back on it for a long time. They discussed the possibilities of international, uh, national teams competitions, club international competitions, but they didn't really do anything. Until you get to 1979 and um, there's a competition for women's football um, in Italy. And in Italy, there was, uh, in the early, in the late 70s, there was three different organizations organizing women's football and they had a lot of corporate interests so they were paying players to play and, uh, and towards the end of 79 there was one um, government body not affiliated to the men's body and they had a lot of corporate interest sponsorship and they organized this international tournament and there was 12 teams there including Northern Ireland and um, they competed in this and this was put in, and they were trying to organize uh, get a meeting with all the different um, women's teams together to organize co more competitions. So this was another external threat to UEFA. So then they reconvened um, a subcommittee on women's football and they started to talk about seriously organizing a competition. But it's not until 1982 when they actually do announce the first competition. And even in 1980-81, even though they promised it, a lot of people didn't think it was going to happen. So um, there's correspondence between um, the Ladies Football Association um, and the WFA about organising a Five Nations tournament between Britain and Ireland because they don't think this UEFA competition is going to happen and they want uh, each country to, every year to, or, to host it. So that's the only way to go ahead. But then um, that never happened then because the UEFA competition was announced in '82. So um, that's just a co cover of the first rules. So um, the first rules uh, for the UEFA tournament were quite similar to the rules that UEFA issued in 73. And um, they said that the competition would go ahead every two years, but they still changed that after the first competition. And uh, they would only go ahead if at least 12 teams registered, but 16 registered for the first, first one. And... Um, even though they'd have to cover all their own expenses. So it's a huge undertaking. Uh, details of the competition were sent to the UEFA members. All the teams from Britain and Ireland, with the exception of Wales, signed up for the first competition. So what they did was to help mitigate against some of the costs is that the group stages, the groupings were done based on regions. So Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland and England were all in one group. And the Nordic countries that registered were in one group. And, um, and that was to help to limit the co travel costs. And uh, because everybody had limited funding, there were voluntary run organizations that some had some small funding from sports councils, but a lot of it was fundraised and um, through membership affiliation fees. And uh, despite the large costs, 
also there was a penalty if you withdrew from the competition after registering and that was £650 at the time which is over £2,000 today which is like you know quite ironic if you can't afford to travel to your match but you have to then pay another penalty on top of that <laughs> it's uh, it's quite punitive and um, we have approximate figures on what it costs the England team to compete in the first tournament. So for the group stages, it approximately costs them £11,705, which is, as you can see, uh, close to, it's nearly £40,000, which is a substantial amount of money considering their funding streams. And they really debated these uh, in the, you can see in the WFA minutes, they really debated whether or not they were going to participate in this competition because of the exorbitant costs that it would be incurred. But them, along with the other countries, felt that it was a great opportunity that couldn't be missed. That the Although it was going to be financially difficult, it would uh, really do a lot to increase the profile of the game and help develop the sport and get more coverage and get more people involved in playing. So the group stages. So um, you can see how they've grouped them geographically um, together and Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland were in group two and these are a few program covers that are in the Prony collection as well so I can give you some insights into the matches and some nice photographs there as well. So planning the matches so as soon as the group stages were announced and um, the WFA secretary uh, wrote to all the governing bodies in their group and arranged um, uh, a meeting face-to-face -to, -face to so that they could plan their uh, the group stages of the competition. And um, they proposed Liverpool as an ideal location for every quite central place for everybody to come together to meet. And um, so they all met in 1982 on the 25th of April. And then a couple of days later, we could, there's a letter in the Prony collection um, from the, w, the SWFA and where they said that we hope um, that we will have a closer working relationship as a direct result of this meeting. So it just really helped to solidify those relationships together to help plan and develop the game um, more nationally. So some of the rules. So um, today the rules are the same between men and women, but it wasn't like that until uh, in the early periods of women's football. Um, so I don't know exactly when the rules changed to be the same, but in... Uh, the first tournament uh, matches were for 70 minutes, so 35 minutes each half, uh, where they increased that by the second tournament. And currently it's 45, but I'm not sure exactly what date when they made that change, the 45 minutes. So all teams played against each other twice at all stages of the competition. So they played on a home and away basis. So even the finals were a home and away basis as well. There wasn't like you have today where you go to one location and play all your final uh, matches there. Um, so the winners from each group played in the semi-finals and then those winners then played in the final. And a size four ball was used and from the second competition onwards they used a size five. Um, so that's important because the men's use a size five as well. So um, they, were, they did a survey after the competition and they asked what, when they, they originally had in their rules a size four ball for women's football, but a lot of countries were using size five. So when they actually got them to do the entry um, information, they asked, what size ball do you use? So then they made that change based on the number of applicants they had for the second tournament. And teams earned two points for a win and one for a draw. So we have a picture here from the first, uh, the opening game in the Women's Euros tournament in 82. It was held in Seaview. And, um, and this kind of gives an insight into the costs and stuff involved. So the Scottish team chartered a flight to Belfast to come over and because that was the most effective and cheapest way to travel at the time which sounds very luxurious but it was just the most cost effective way and you could see their schedule they flew in 10 30 a.m they arrived in Belfast and um, they had a short training session before the match at Seaview they played the match and then they had a social event afterwards and then they went flew home and you can imagine like these all these players they're from all over Scotland you know so they had, would have had a lot of traveling that morning as well to get, even get to the chartered flight and um and you can see the details of their, this uh, match up in the Prony Archive, which is brilliant. And, uh, but in a news, they, Northern Ireland lost the match and Scotland won 2-1. Uh, but this uh, review of the match is quite interesting. So Tony Kelly, who was the manager for Republic of Ireland, came up to watch the game. And he said, neither side produced the type of football we have come to expect from them. 
Scotland could have had the game sewn up at half time, but their finishing was not up to the standard we witnessed when they visited Daly Mount Park in March 1981, when they beat us 6 0. So you can imagine what impact travelling on the day of the game had to get to the match on the quality of the football as well. Because, uh, you know, these players had full time jobs to do. So they're giving up their time, they had to take time away from work to come and play international football. But also, um, I got the impression from some players as well that the troubles was also having an impact on the amount of time the teams wanted to spend in Northern Ireland too as well. So uh, that was another impact. But financially was the key reason because they weren't getting any fund additional funding to participate in the competition. Um, so this is from the match in England against England. And this was their biggest defeat where they lost 7-1. And uh, but they did get a goal against them, which is uh, one of the few goals they've ever scored against England, which is great. <laughs> um, and uh, we can see some of the players there in the match programs. And um, so then we have just the overview of how they did in the tournament. So there's only two matches where they didn't score any goals. I know they didn't really um, win, but at least they got some goals. <laughs> and it's the first tournament as well. So it's about getting that experience at that international level. So this is how uh, the Group 2 final table looked like. So you can see England was, um, you know, their standard in football in England was a lot higher than it was in the other countries. So they won the group. And um, in the first two or three tournaments, the first two tournaments, England was in the group and they always won. The third tournament onwards, the, the grouping started to change. So after the group stages, UEFA did make some input and they decided to give some funding towards the competition. But you can see the figures there that like it doesn't really scratch the surface for the costs involved in the national teams. And especially when the teams, you know, only one team from each group can qualify. So that's really difficult. It's not like in the men's where you get a, maybe two teams and then you get a playoff space and stuff like that as well to go to the finals. So the costs involved. So some people took this as quite negative and said, oh, well, what's the point in participating if you're not going to win? Whereas it actually had a huge impact on developing at an international level to be able to progress and do better in future tournaments. And um, the semi-finals of the first tournament. So you can see all the group winners. And then um, England played against Denmark and Sweden played against Italy. And then we got to the finals. It was a Sweden-England um, final. And they played the first match of the final in Sweden and the final match of the final in England. <laughs> and they played in Luton's uh, stadium. But um, they wanted to host the game in London, but none of the clubs in London would release their pitches to the women's national team. So that kind of shows the, um, the difficulties they still had in getting access to stadiums. And you can just see the conditions of the pitch was terrible. There was um, a lot of rain and it was, um, you know, it was horrific conditions. And some people have said that if it was a men's match, it wouldn't have gone ahead because it was so bad. And they were just slipping and sliding everywhere. But the match, uh, the final ended in a draw. So it went to penalties then. And England just narrowly missed out. So it's only uh, last, uh, the last UEFA tournament in 2022 when they won. They've reached maybe the final three or four times and uh, they won it, took the title in 2022. So a review of the tournament, UEFA did a survey of all the people who participated and um, I would have liked to have given you more information on uh, that, but there's a lot of text, but these are just some of the highlights from it. So Denmark responded positively, but highlighted that they would be in favour of changing the duration of matches to 45 minutes per each way. So it kind of shows that the women's team their rules were different, but they didn't want to play by different rules. They wanted to play the same game as everybody else. And um, I don't have it in here, but Italy were quite critical of how the tournament was organized because they had to play in their semi-final against Sweden. And they were playing in um, early late spring. But in Sweden, the ground is still frozen. And in Italy, the ground is not. So that's why they were saying that um, they shouldn't do the home and away version of the tournament because the conditions are so... Uh, they're not standardized, so they should go to one location and play the finals there. And um, But it wasn't until a number of years later, tournaments later, before they did that. So Wales stated that they could not participate in the first or any subsequent competitions because of the lack of financial support. 
as the only country in Britain and Ireland not to participate meant that their international team has only been able to play it on an occasional basis as the neighbouring countries have full fixtures list through the competitive matches. So this shows the negative impact that the tournament had as well because for those who couldn't participate, it really um, reduced the opportunities they had to develop at a national level. And many members also commented that entering the competition had increased the media coverage they received, as well as led to increasing the number of women and girls participating in football. So you can start to see the positive impact that's having on developing the game. So some reflections on that tournament. Um, so in the match programme for England versus Northern Ireland that was held at Crewe, Alexandra, um, Lewis Waters, uh, the chairman of the UEFA Committee for Women's Football said, uh, however, there is more to it than just organising a championship. Not all national associations wish to enter the competition as their social conceptions are opposed to it. I sincerely hope that they will join us soon. So this really reflects the attitudes towards women's football within UEFA um, membership and uh, the struggles that they had from 1971 when it was first recognised and they first started to discuss national, uh, international tournament for national teams. And um, the only 16 teams registered for the first competition. So the first couple of competitions is quite a low number of members uh, joining it. But even if we look at the last tournament, 2022, there's at least a handful of teams, countries that didn't participate in the qualifying rounds. So hopefully, uh, I haven't looked for 2025 yet to see if all those members have participated. But even in the last one, there was one or two nations as well that participated for the first time in the UEFA competitions. So there's still a way to go and having that equality. So although we've got great strides in England and Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland in supporting the women's national team, it's not the same in every country. Every country is different, which is why you see the diff, um, some of the gaps in the level of uh, football and why recently UEFA, it's probably why UEFA has the now three-tiered um, Nations League as well, because they don't all have equal support and funding and infrastructure to help develop the game. Uh, but another qu important question, so the records here in Prony are brilliant, they're really, really good. But what are we historians in the future going to do when a lot of what's being discussed about the game is taking place online? So that's where my other hat comes in, so the web archive. So I work at the British Library in the UK web archive team. So the UK web archive uh, is the uh, a group of the UK Legal Deposit Libraries, so it's the British Library, National Library of Scotland, National Library of Wales, and then three other university legal deposit libraries, so Trinity College in Dublin and Oxford, uh, Bodleian Libraries in Oxford and Cambridge University Library as well. And we formed the UK Web Archive and through there we're archiving um, the major events happening in the UK. But Prony also have their own web archive that focuses on um, Maybe Stephen, if you want to, or, or Neve, if you want to say a little bit about Prony Archive. Yeah. Yeah, but there's gaps in that collection as well, because what you do for people, the everyday publications, the media publications and uh, the other commentary that happens online around um, different events in, the, in that are happening here and wider across the UK. But uh, that's why the UK Web Archive has a, a broader scope of collecting. And sports is one area that we collect a lot on as well, and especially focused on in the last couple of years. So um, some of the collaborations we've done with Prony to help them bridge those gaps is uh, around the UEFA Women's Euros collection. So because uh, Northern Ireland qualified for the tournament for the first time. And so the uh, Prony staff helped to make sure that Northern Ireland is well represented in this collection. And you can see one of the photographs that comes from the uh, Prony collection as well that was in a blog post on the UK Web Archive blog. And um, I don't know if you know, but uh, last October, the British Library suffered a cyber attack. So we still have limited access to our collections, but we are releasing some of our date, um, seed lists. So the website and the metadata related to that website that we've selected for that collection as data. And we've just published the UEFA collection. So if anybody wants to have a look to see what we've published, you can go to this link and you can download the um, data set. Um, but our other collections, Keep an eye on the uh, British Library blog and there'll be more updates on when you can access the collections.
So another one we, uh, that year that we collected on, uh, we, 2022 was a very busy sporting year <laughs> uh, because there was also the uh, Rugby League World Cup happening that year as well. But we collaborated on the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham because there was, a, again, a strong Northern Irish presence in that tournament, that event, and we wanted to make sure that it was well represented. So the collaborations between the different institutions is really important to help bridge the gap in some of what would be the gaps in archive collections. And um, so that hopefully will be back available online soon. And just more recently, we've just wrapped up the um, 2024 Summer Olympics and Paralympics collection. So this wasn't curated through the UK Web Archive. It was through an international membership organization of web archives, um, the IIPC, so the International Internet Preservation Consortium. And so lots of different web archive teams around the world um, nominated content, uh, mostly to do with their country, and uh, so you can see a lot of the countries there. And we also had a public nomination form and um, Neve is in the room, helped select some content for us as well to, um, to pry and make sure that Northern Ireland was well represented in this collection. And um, you can see that there's a lot of countries covered, but there's still countries that don't have a tag. And even if some of them have got content nominated from that country, it might be very small compared to another country that has a lot more. So the distribution could be a bit uneven, which is why we always love to get nominations from the public for any of our collections that we do. And the same goes for the UK Web Archive, because the more people nominated content, the more diversity you're going to have in the collection. And um, so that should be coming online in towards the end of the year. So we've just finished the collecting phase and we're just organizing the metadata. And then we'll be uh, publishing that online in the next couple of weeks. And um, so I'll actually, before I go to thank you, uh, the next big sporting event coming up, though, that will include Northern Ireland is, um, I actually don't know which one's coming first now. There's the Commonwealth Games are coming, but they're going to be in Glasgow. So with the UK Web Archive, the Olympics is uh, transnational. So we can only collect UK content. So that's why we do it through the IIPC, because we can't collect stuff through the UK Web Archive from other countries. But uh, if big events are hosted in the UK, we can. So the Commonwealth Games are coming back to Glasgow. Um, but I can't remember what year that is. Uh, it's, it's not that far away, I don't think. Yeah, so 26, yeah. So uh, that's coming up first, actually. So that'll be the next big uh, tournament. But there's also the Women's Rugby World Cup is coming up next year as well. And then there's the uh, Commonwealth Games coming from 26. And then there's um, the UEFA tournament, the men's UEFA tournament, that's going to be hosted across Britain and Ireland. Not so that, sorry? Not yet, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Have they decided on that yet? Oh, OK, I missed it. <laughs> I was following the debates about some of it, but then I've, I haven't been able to follow for the last while. But um, so we'll be making sure that um, anything happening here will be documented in that, if it happens or not, because those also debates that have been happening recently are also really important to document that as well. Because when you're looking back at the history of these tournaments, the um, thing, the negative and the positive, it's always good to have perspective, both perspectives. And uh, so there's a lot more collaborations coming down the line. And that's the end of my presentation. So I want to allow some time for questions and comments.